For thousands of years, civilization has been a destructive force, both ecologically and culturally. Deep in the abyss of the sixth extinction, the future of humanity and our other-than-human kin hangs by a thread. At this pivotal moment in time, we must reach back into the depths of the human story and uncover our mistakes. I invite you to go with me down the rabbit hole as I seek out the silenced, forgotten, buried, abandoned, and demonized stories and practices of regenerative, egalitarian, place-based cultures. There is still time to reconnect with what we have lost, to restore our broken relationships to the land where we dwell, and to remember the human place in the wild. Hello, welcome to the Rewilding Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Michael Bauer. I'm coming to you from Portland, Oregon, the traditional territory of the Multnomah and Clackamas Chinookan people, as well as the Kalapuya, Malala, Cowlitz, and many other tribal groups who have lived here, subsisted here, and traveled here to trade and make their living since time immemorial. This podcast is produced in partnership with Rewild Portland, a nonprofit organization, and is made possible through financial support from our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. If you feel inspired by this podcast, please subscribe, share it on social media, and write a review on Apple Podcasts. The best way to keep the podcast going is to become a patron at patreon.com slash Bauer. On this episode of the Rewilding Podcast, I converse with Carmen Spaniola about the necessary self and community care that comes with the realization that we are living in a collapse. Carmen works at the intersection of somatics, trauma recovery, attachment, and mysticism. Her approach to collapse, navigating the converging emergencies of large-scale cooperation dilemmas, weaves Wendell Berry sensibilities with Octavia Butler realities. Her book, The Spirited Kitchen, Recipes and Rituals for the Wheel of the Year, comes out in the fall of 2022. Well, thank you for coming on the show, Carmen. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation, Peter. I have a like a funny anecdote I want to start with, which is that, um, so, you know, when we organized, when Rewild Portland organized the Rewilding Conference this year, my friend Melissa, who's on the board of directors or was on the board of directors and is still on the, the, um, conference committee was like, oh, we should get Carmen Spaniola to come on to the conference. And I was like, oh, who's she? You know, and I looked up and I saw all your stuff and I was like, oh, this is great. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And then you came to the conference, you spoke and we were like, oh, this is so great. And then I'm like, oh, I've got to have her on my podcast, you know? And then I'm like on a walk with a friend of mine last week and he's like, hey, it was really great that Carmen was at the conference. I was surprised and, and it, you know, it was super cool. I didn't realize that you were like connected with her. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And he was like, well, you know, because of the article in your in your rewilding 101 class. And I was like, what article? He was like, oh, well, you've been recommending that, you know, Utney reader article for like six (laughs) years or something for your rewilding class. And I was like, wait, what? And he was like, yeah, Carmen's like the person in the article that you've been (laughs) recommending for six years. And I was like, what? That's their family? And he was like, yeah, you didn't know that? I thought you, I thought you'd like planned the whole thing. And I was like, oh my God, that's so amazing. But I didn't realize that, you know, because so for the last like six years in my Rewilding 101 class, I recommend that Utney Reader article that where they interviewed your family. (laughs) And I just thought it was so funny. You know, it's just such a small world. It Um, is, but you know what? Okay, this is so great. This is the first time I can put on the record. So uh, Josiah, who was the the uh, the journalist, he came to our house. He like came for two or three days. We like you know all the stuff that's in the article. Like they did apple cider. We like had this nice lunch with the rabbits, all that kind of stuff. I had said to him in my kitchen multiple times. The thing about collapses, it is going to be so rife with death and we live in a death phobic culture. And so this is why I recommend you go talk to, and I gave him a few other names and he went and consulted some of them. They also appear in the article. And then he writes in the article, she says this thing, but I wonder if she really understands the implications of what she's saying. And I'm like, for fuck's sake, like, <laughs> I was like, I, I, 
am perfectly aware. <laughs> I articulate many times. So I know that the editor, you know, like they kind of have to have a sort of stylistic, mm. you know, thing and create a story. And I'm like, yeah, no, I said it to you multiple times. Billions of people will die. And we have to be able to metabolize that, that grief, that confusion, that pause in our cultural continuity. Um, and now, of course, we have pandemic. And I'm like, Oof, okay, we're not at the scale that I'm talking about, but this is like a glimpse. And the the amount of um, sort of denial and uh, phobia and the the inability to project out like just down the road a few years here to a different way of being and the impacts of this are so obvious to me that I'm like, okay, yeah, if he interviewed me now, I, I right. you know, I, I'm not even sure how I would even talk about that because it's like, yeah, no, if there was a solution for this, we would have we would have done something differently here. Totally. Um, so anyway, thank you for bringing that up. I love that article. I recommend it to people. And I'm, and, and I'm always like, it's not as gloomy as it sounds. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's been a, in the very last week of my class, I have a sort of a spectrum of different people doing rewilding adjacent things. Um, and that's the one that I use as an example for people who live in the urban context who, you know, can't like one of the, the extreme example is like Phoenicia Madrano or Lynx Vilden who are like living in buckskin, you know, <laughs> hunting and gathering off the grid in the middle of nowhere. Um, and that's just not accessible to most people. And I feel like um, what you offer is a sort of accessible way of thinking and processing and um, acting on like what to do with this knowledge of collapse. That's awesome. Thanks for bringing so, that back around. Yeah, yeah. So I'm curious, you know, um, your work focuses on collapse. And I think that was one of the cool things too about the conference is like, you know, I was 16 and I read Daniel Quinn's book, Ishmael. And I was like, oh, the collapse of civilization is going to happen like next fucking year. I'm going <laughs> to drop out of high school, run away from home and learn wilderness survival so that I can at least survive the collapse of civilization, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Um, and so I'm curious, like, um, what to you is collapse? And how is that? How did you come to it? Everybody should also read Ishmael, by the way, if they <laughs> haven't. Uh, yeah, that that will inspire that kind of response at almost any age. Um, well, similarly, about 1990, I was like, maybe it was a little earlier. It, it was grade nine or 10 or something like that. So it was like 89, 90, something like that. Uh, my stepdad, uh, he worked in the oil patch his whole life. And he mentioned in passing peak oil. And we had a super tense relationship, but that actually like kind of made me sit up. Like I, I really had sort of a disdain for kind of his redneck kind of way, mm. but he had this like privilege knowledge that it was like, yeah, for sure. In your lifetime, like he was, it was kind of like, you know, enjoy it while it's here, buttercup, but like, you know, you're on your own and, um, here's this thing, peak oil. And so I kind of did the same thing where I was like, oh man, I got to get mine early and like <laughs> try to protect myself because, um, <clears throat> yeah, the world is like, not as I've been promised. Totally. Yeah. And then I had a big personal collapse in 2009 after the great recession. Um, I had a personal bankruptcy and that was kind of like the end of the world that I'd thought was going to be kind of a general collective thing. I realized that I was experiencing totally in isolation mm -hmm. <laughs> with like no safety net and no people and a ton of shame about it. And I fortunately did recover from that. Um, but I realized like, oh, wow, I'm not as resilient as I, once again, I thought there were these protections or I thought I just didn't realize how fragile our world was and how that was going to impact me personally. Then in 2011, I went to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings uh, around on um, Indian residential schools in Canada. Then I realized, oh, entire cultures have collapsed in, you know, recent generations. Oh, they, they have collapsed and are in varying stages of recovery. But 
that I, I just knew right away. I was like, oh, this is a model. What is needed to address? And, you know, we can't reconcile, I don't think, but, you know, move towards repair. We're, we're all going to need this. I could just see right away. This was an important model. Um, and then, yeah, my partner and I, it, in this sort of personal recovery from bankruptcy, et cetera, I started to really get into stuff like um, blogs, like the oil drum and the automatic earth and writers like John Michael Greer, Nicole Foss, uh, Sharon Astick continues to be an icon of mine. I still follow her on Facebook. The only reason I'm on Facebook is to follow Sharon <laughs> Astick and her sort of pandemic coverage, but um, she's written a number of really good books, uh, independence days and, and collapsing in place kinds of books. Um, so that became um, a, pretty central to my life was like, okay, I've experienced it personally. I sense it's coming collectively. There are models for how we're going, how we could move forward together. Um, I need to learn these skills. And so I essentially, you know, I started wanting to like, I did the prepper stuff, <laughs> how to can food, <laughs> yep. you know, got my hunting license, hate guns, but have my shooting license, like all that kind of stuff, really focused on wilderness things, uh, taking my work out into the wilderness and doing quest work. Those are all, you know, um, th those are collapse skills. Those are, and, and, and I do feel like even spiritually, that kind of like wilderness um, skill, survival skill work like if you can't create safeness for yourself and embed yourself in the natural world, I have a hard time believing you're ever going to be able to land safeness in the urban world. Mm. What I mean by that is like, I think being able to feel embedded in the natural world is a precursor to being able to feel embedded and connected in anything else, um, any kind of societal structure. So those kinds of skills, how to make fire, how to make shelter, how to read the weather, how to um, read the signs of like divination with the natural world, all those things are important uh, first steps for any other kind of like prepper work you're going to do. Um, and then I started to think much more about the, the death. <laughs> like I was like, oh, this means everything I love. Like, yeah, we're all going to experience that everything we ever love is going to die. But generally we get a, you know, most people have that trickle through in life. There might be like really traumatic experiences for some people, but generally we have a model for the beginning, middle and end of a person's life and pretty much how it's going to go and decline. There are anomalous things that we call tragedies but really, even that's pretty predictable. But this large scale die off is just beyond the human capacity to really understand and metabolize and grapple. But we have to. So I started to do a lot of study and training around grief and death work. And then, of course, that leads to training around trauma, um, also around attachment work. I really enjoy um, Oh, Carolyn, you'll remember her last name. I can't remember it right now, but she wrote uh, Love in a Time of Apocalypse. Um, mm, that sounds Carolyn, good. Carolyn, <laughs> yeah. She also wrote Conscious Collapsing. Hmm. Carolyn Baker, that's who it is, Carolyn Baker. So I, yeah, I was reading all of Carolyn Baker's work and realized like, oh, I need to do more attachment hmm. training. And then you get into attachment, you're like, oh, that's about like somatically processing. <clears throat> and then recently with Pandemic, just like all the chickens came home to roost, right? Like I was working online for a long time doing um, psycho-spiritual work. And uh, it used to be hard to convince people that you could do a lot of stuff online. And then in the beginning of the pandemic, when everybody got like Zoom literate, I was a pretty <laughs> early adopter, like yeah. Zoom since 2014. So nice. this was really cool. People started sort of flocking to my co-regulation mm. collapse um, kinds of work. And one thing I noticed was like, oh, I can see it. I can sense it. There, there was a period where I had... Um, these co-healing pods running. So I would see like groups, small groups of six people, like 10 of them a week, 
plus my individual clients. So I was seeing quite a few different people for about an eight to 10 week um, period, uh, right in the beginning of pandemic and ever since. And I could see the collective freeze. Mm. I could just see everybody like getting like numb and stuck and trapped and was like, oh, wow, this is like palpable. And I talk about like, I try to explain to people, it's kind of like, um, you know, you think of movies where they're like in a snowstorm and they're trying to like find a cabin and there's a group and they're like trying to find it. And somebody's like, oh, I just need to have a breath, a, a break. I'm just going to rest in this. I'm just going to have a little nap. And one person's like, don't fall asleep in the snow. <laughs> right. That was me early pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> just everybody don't fall asleep in the snow. We just yeah. have to stay a tiny mm-hmm. bit mm-hmm. mobilized. Mm-hmm. And so that's pretty much what I've been doing since then is like, helping people metabolize and stay kind of mobilized, um, in this like large scale collapse event. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I have a a bunch of different thoughts around that. I think, you know, um, uh, well, one thing just is what I deeply appreciate about your work is just the, that, um, not a lot of people are just like, so, aware of the collapse and it like and live and breathe it it's just like part of their everyday everything (laughs) Mm -hmm. and i think that was you know one of the uh lessons for me in in hearing you speak at the rewilding conference is because i've been doing this for 20 years um, because i've been aware of it for so long i don't even think about the fact that most people are unaware of that that is the future right it's bonkers right yeah and i think like how do you live (laughs) right (laughs) you know there's been like little things that have made it more um more in the collective conscious like you know even just something like al gore's inconvenient truth you know like little things Uh that that kind of make people go oh shit," you know Mm -hmm. um but i think just i i don't talk about it in such like a stark um, if, you know, in, in the way that I feel like you did, and I could tell just from the reactions of people's faces that were at the conference, that it was like, uh, a premise that I don't put up front that should be up front. Mm. Um, you know, just people's reactions. I could just by looking at going, oh, like, oh, right. Like this is, this is important. And this is something that is like a part of this whole thing. You know, I think you, people can think about rewilding as like, a uh, you know, well, I'm just going to go like meditate in the forest, like, you know, mm-hmm. um, but, but they're not, I'm like, you know, I'm rewilding because our culture is, you know, unsustainable and we need yeah, to figure out. Cause we might have to, to take live. to the road. I actually yeah. don't think we have to take to the road, anytime soon, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's true. A lot of people, um, ha- again, have the kind of like that vague awareness of it, right? Like we've known about it for a long time, but it does take some pretty sensitizing events for that to become muscle memory. And totally. I think a lot of people, well, and you know, okay, I'm going to give us a bit of credit here, right? That not everybody is actually a systems thinker. Sure. We don't, we live in such a siloed kind of culture and we try to like privilege certain kinds of systemic knowledge. And so we don't learn, we're, we're, we're actively uh, discouraged uh, when it comes to thinking about how systems interlock. Otherwise totally. we wouldn't just be pretty recently becoming broadly aware of intersectionalism, you know? Yeah. So um, yeah, it's kind of unusual to make those uh, connections that are kind of implicit or backgrounded really foreground them and make them explicit. Yeah. There was like a vice article. I remember from like a year or two ago and the, the headline was civilization may already be collapsing. <laughs> I was just like, are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> you know, like, huh, they're so yeah. cute. Yeah, I know. So right. Cute. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there's just like so much, uh, so much there. Like, um, and then I forgot my train of thoughts from the other thing. So I'm just going to jump into the next thing, which is, sure. um, uh, Kiko, one of my friends was really excited about one of the things that you brought up at the conference, which I also really deeply appreciated, which is the difference between like a problem and a predicament oh, yeah. and how like problems have solutions, predicaments don't. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, how do you frame that around the collapse? Yeah. So people 
often think like, oh, there's here's this large problem. So if we define collapse in just super simply as large scale cooperation dilemmas, where there are no obvious solutions, then what we have instead are responses. And so we tend in such a like binary and hierarchical society and one that is deeply invested in exploitation mm -hmm. <laughs> and like capitalism and like these systems that, oh, everything's a problem that we can solve. So we just need to like get better minds on or we need to design jam it or we need to like, et cetera, et cetera. But actually uh, when we're in, an ecosystem, when we're looking at systems, very rarely are there actual problems that can be solved. There are predicaments that we need to respond to. Totally. And I actually would suggest that a lot of the like big problems that we're trying to solve are collapse that needs to occur. Mm. It's collapse that we are actually actively delaying by mm -hmm. saying, oh, it's a problem. We just have to find totally. a solution. Yes. So you can choose anything. Right now, somebody, somebody asked me, um, Somebody on, on, on my, my team, she's a close friend of mine, was, uh, she's helping me with my, my book launch and was like, well, how, when you're in the media, how are you going to sort of share, you know, in your cookbook, you talk about white supremacy and um, capitalism and all this stuff. How, how are you going to respond um, and show that you are not a white woman perpetuating white supremacy? And I was like, so I will redirect that question every time because there is no way as a white person that I can not perpetuate white supremacy. It's, it's like I can try to mitigate it, but actually my presence as a lighter skinned person is going to dysregulate other folks in the same way that I actually can't divest from all of my unearned privilege. Like the advantage just is there, totally. whether I want it or not. Totally. Actually, white supremacy is a collapse that needs to happen. Yeah. And we're all so fucking terrified of like, yeah. well, what are the alternatives that we act as though it's a problem with a solution? But I don't believe that it is. Uh, it's a totally. collapse that needs to happen. So that's kind of how I frame it. I just try to redirect people away from like, what do we do? It's like you, there's nothing to do. And in in my attachment for parents uh, classes, I often talk about embracing futility. That futility is one of the most important emotions that a child can experience mm. because futility is the gateway to grief. Mm. And if we can get to the grief part and the futility then we can actually have like the, the deep somatic discharge and we can like have mm. people with us and hold us in that despair. And what will naturally happen is aliveness will come back in. Totally. And so I try to get people to embrace futility <laughs> as much as possible, not necessarily on your own. This is the other thing you talked about. Um, uh, I don't remember if we were recording or not, but the idea <laughs> that, um, that like rewilding the, you know, there were folks who were using that term in like a optimize, optimize, optimize life hack kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes self-optimizing that is not useful totally. <laughs> in a collapse scenario. No. So I'm not saying, oh, let's embrace futility and go into despair by ourselves. Mm. It's like not at all what I'm saying. We, yeah. Ideally, what we want to do is collapse in community. And so in the same way that we don't leave our child alone with futility, we like sidle right up to them and let them feel that like the most important thing is that they aren't alone in this terrible thing they have to accept. It's the same with collapse. It's the same with white supremacy. It's the same with any of these things that need to collapse. Um, I try to frame that as like, just accept that it's a predicament. Then you'll move into futility. Then we can get to the grief. And that's actually when aliveness can come in. Because of course, grief and love are going to travel hand in hand. And then what you really care about at the end of the day, in your last breath, what do you really care about? That becomes more obvious. And totally. then you can keep working to, and reaching towards what you care about. And that's, that's the, what do we do answer? Mm. So it's going to be mm -hmm. different for everyone. But the thing that you do is you keep reaching towards what you care about. The thing that's still worth fighting for the thing that you were born to do <laughs> and that you're going to yeah. do until you die. It's going to be <laughs> who you love and what you care right. about. Right. Yeah. How are you doing, Peter? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm very deep in okay. thought. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting because, um, again, I feel like there's this uh, a one of my blind spots or not necessarily blind spots, but um, it is this idea of of not 
uh, front loading my class of rewilding 101 with collapse. And we do have a whole, like one of the whole sections is about the Anthropocene extinction. So it is about mm -hmm. the collapse and we go into all of the factors and, you know, I call it the Anthropocene flow chart where we create this mm -hmm. like chart on the wall of like, you know, what monoculture leads to, you know, this thing, which leads to this thing, which leads to soil loss, which leads to ocean acidification, which leads to, you know, mm -hmm. and all these different things that are leading to this extinction. And it's like one of the most depressing classes, <laughs> Sure. you know, and I'm like, I promise you in the next one, it'll, this will be more <laughs> uplifting or whatever, you know? Um, and, uh, most people come out of the class, like feeling inspired because of, uh, I think the tools and the examples that I'm able to show people, but at the same time, there's like this, um, because my class is very much, uh, like in our heads, it's very heady. It's like history lessons, lectures, discussion. It's not like embodied. Right. And I mm -hmm. think that a lot of the, um, the people who are who are learning just about collapse, who haven't like had this as a, as a central part of their life for a long time, um, can end up being paralyzed or being, or, or start to carry that trauma in, in their body. It makes me think of like, you know, I, I was just talking about this, I think in a different podcast where, you know, the saying ignorance is bliss, right? Like, <laughs> um, and also there's some filmmaker or writer, I don't remember, I thought it was maybe Stephen King or somebody who said like suspense isn't not knowing what's going to happen suspense is knowing what's going to happen but not knowing when yeah. right? so there's like this anticipation and i think about that with collapse all the time like just not knowing when and how frustrating and you know almost just like you know being on a, on a train or something and knowing it's going to crash and everybody else is mm -hmm. asleep it's like the classic sort mm -hmm. of metaphors that people use you know mm -hmm. um and so i i want to kind of turn towards the the work that you do in terms of like embodying and moving through trauma with this kind of knowledge because i think uh just having it and and living with that suspense or that it, it almost can like create a, a state of psychological fear and paralysis as totally. opposed to just like um understanding what to do and it's not necessarily you know my my dad was in vietnam you know and i've asked him lots of questions about it over the years and one of the things that he said to me was like you know in any situation uh, when we were on like the battlefield, every reaction was different for every different time. Like sometimes, you know, you might be the hero or whatever. And another time you might be like cowering and shitting your pants. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And every time was just so different. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot about that too. And I think a lot about, um, training, uh, you know, one of the, one of the sayings in the wilderness first responder training is, you don't rise to the occasion, you sink to your level of training. And that's why they do mm -hmm. all of these constant scenarios where mm -hmm. in their training, you're constantly like doing intense, uh, you know, like with real or not real blood, but fake blood that looks real, you know, like all of these mm -hmm. things to try to get you to be able to respond without um, that kind of paralysis. Um, and so anyway, I'm, I'm just, I guess paralysis is the main sort of um, thing that I'm thinking about. And how do you work with the folks that you do on like moving people through and out of paralysis? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's a really good question. And this is where, like you say, the training comes in that we're going to sink to the level of our training. So I've done a lot of trauma therapy training <laughs> and somatic trauma sensitivity work. Um, and the, the, the good thing is, is that it's not rocket science, actually. And so you can spend a lot to become like, say, an SE, a somatic experiencing practitioner or a, whatever it is. But you don't need that, actually. Um, most people, 80% of like, it, it's Pareto's law, right? 80% of what you're going to need, you can do with like 20% of the actual skill set. Mm. <laughs> it's like, this is what we're going to use most of the time, 80-20 rule. So that's great. And any anybody who wants to um, empower themselves or who is somebody with a duty of care. I mean, I think we all have a duty of care to our communities, but of course we're gonna, we have a duty of care to our children, our friends, our family, et cetera. If that's you, if, if you're a person in connection, you should know some basic trauma literacy. And so when it comes to paralysis, there are many different kinds. And so, like you said, 
there's a lot of different ways that you can respond. You might have what you think is your default setting, but you don't know, it's very situational. So it's good to have an overall framework. So specifically with paralysis, we're talking about a kind of freeze and there are many kinds of freeze. There's a functional freeze where you're just tasking all the time. Like I know when I'm kind of like, I don't look dissociated because I'm cleaning my house like a whirling dervish, <laughs> <laughs> basically like going left mm. to right. I'm in my head. I'm like pissed off about something, but I'm like not feeling it. I'm just like rammy jammy or people are workaholics or they're whatever. So there's like a highly functional freeze. There's also a kind of freeze that's like alert, you know, like attentive immobility, which is more like a deer in headlights. Mm. So you're, you're physically frozen, but like your eyes are darting about You're you're aware that like you're, you're a spring that's coiled and you're like trying to figure out which way to go. And then there's that more like a a tonic immobility. Like it's like catatonic, right? Mm, Super mm -hmm. depressive affect, um, really hard to upregulate when you're like feeling like a slug. Right. And it's just like, what is the point? Why am I even here? So each of these is going to require a different kind of touch. And this is where attunement comes in. And again, capitalism is really good at training us to not attune to ourselves or to others. We we're conditioned day in, day out to override our sense of distress, our sense of fatigue, our sense that something's wrong. So that's like a first place to start is like, how do I even know like what is happening for me right now? And there's so many good courses. There's even like Instagram therapy that that's just going to be really helpful with for people. That's like low or no cost. Um, for me as a practitioner and a teacher, it's a little bit different. So uh, like, I'll, this is just me talking to you and maybe there's other practitioners out there. The most important thing I do with students is I keep their arms and legs on. And so I just sort of cue them and keep training them. Keep your arms and legs on, feel your seat, feel your feet. And we'll do like a little thing. Like we're just going to go left, right, left, right with our, our heels as though we're like, we're sitting in our chair, but we're like walking, Mm. just pressing the heels left, right, left, right. We're going to flex and like, you know, grip and release our Uh, fists right now. And what we're trying to do is stay slightly mobilized. We want to send more signal to our brain because when we get into paralysis, that is actually the most heightened state of fighting for your life. It doesn't necessarily look like it because you're not moving, Mm. but that actually is the highest degree of terror. So when you're depressed, it might not look like you're in a high level of threat, but physiologically in your body, all your organs, everything's just like going into like deep energy conservation mode, because you don't know if you're going to live through this or not. You're kind of going, you're, you're a possum, right? Mm. So what we want to do is we want to come very slowly out of the freeze because whatever put you into the freeze, you're going to re-experience it as you come out. It's just going to be a thaw. It just like presses pause on everything, but whatever the terror was, you're going to meet when you come out. So you don't want to do too much rapid embodiment where it's like, okay, we're going to learn about collapse. Let's all go deeply into our bodies and like really (laughs) feel everything that's happening because that can really overwhelm and flood Mm. the system. So instead what we do is we just do slight mobilization. And, And so my cue, I just find it the easiest one. There's a lot of ways to do it, but the easiest one is like, bring your arms and legs on, feel your feet and seat. And I just have them like make fists and release it, or sometimes like sweep their arms, have stretches. And you want to keep doing that probably within 15 minutes, every 15 minutes, because we can't sit for more than that without getting a lot of internal signal to the brain of like, oh my God, there's impending doom. And Mm. when is it going to (laughs) happen? Right. Mm. It's like, don't think of an elephant. So you're, you're like, oh my God, it's right there. So it, it, I normalize that, that that happens. I also, I let my, I've had to work to reveal my affect a little, a little more. I used to be a much more kind of like still face avoidant, stoic kind of person, acerbic sense of humor, just like minimize things. That's, that's like an outward expression of freeze. Right. Mm. And so I've had to really work at at just normalizing the, the tender grief and the terror of it and being in it together. So as a, as a facilitator, what we really want is a lot of containment, 
a lot of containment and the containment is like physical, like feel where you're sitting, you know, notice your doors and windows, but it's also the structure of how I teach it. So I make sure I'm not going too long. Um, we all, I also make sure that there's, it's a high contact nutrition form of instruction. So contact nutrition is how mammals know that it's safer to survive in tribe. So when we're talking about collapse, there's these two really strong drives, right? And this is where we get into attachment. The first one is the drive to survive. Like, <laughs> I got to do something like fight, you know, kind of mm. response. But the other one is the we're safer together. Mm. And so we want to connect with each other. And so there's kind of a spectrum of philosophy and science on this where like Peter Levine at one end is like, oh, okay, well, what we want to do is inspire that fight response. And once we do that, then we can, the other survival response that's a little more subtle and not as urgent or immediate, the attachment that'll come on. Whereas at the other end, we have Stephen Porges, the polyvagal theory guy, who's like, well, but the other thing is we're not being chased by saber toothed tigers. We're not actually fighting off bears most of the time, even though our body is like really mm -hmm. responding like that. You know, the, the threat is not actually imminent. So the other thing we could do could be more gentle on our body, we could present so much safeness that we dissolve the need to fight. And so then we can, we can come together and mm. find our uh, mobilization and our aliveness in that kind of way. We don't have to always like discharge all that fight energy. We could also come into togetherness. So when I'm teaching, I'm making sure there's a lot of contact nutrition, kind eyes, vocal prosody, like safe touch where they're touching themselves, they're touching their bodies or they're shaking it out, you know, like I'm letting them know it's okay to wiggle and move, you know? Um, Just hearing you say these things is making me want to do them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? It's like, like shaking off nice and stuff. Anyway. Totally, yeah. totally. And yeah. then like the, the, the um, <laughs> shared rhythms, right? Where we mm. all just like take a few breaths together. Mm or just let it be quiet together or have a breakout so they can go back and forth in a dyad and have it timed so they each get to be heard and seen. And then the last one is ingestion behaviors and that's eating and drinking. And that's really, sometimes people are like, okay, wait, you're writing a cookbook? Like <laughs> they don't understand <laughs> how it fits. And it's like, yeah, the small and delicious life, what you will find in collapse is that ultimately you're gonna find a form of contact nutrition that feels really like soothing thing and important to you. And mine is like ingestion behaviors, mm. eating and mm -hmm. drinking together mm. that like the, the smallest unit of civilization is the meal. <laughs> never totally. mind the family, never mind the whatever. It's like, it's the meal. Yeah. And so that idea of having like an animistic approach to the wheel of the year and like really focusing on, on the ritual of eating together, I bring stuff like that into the teaching. So I try to talk about collapse when I'm doing something else, like demonstrating my foraged vermouth recipe in a workshop or something. Mm. Um, or conversely, if they're coming to talk about collapse, we're like, what are you drinking right now? What are you eating? And people just go around, or we used to have collapsey hour in this program that I had where people would come, we'd be like, how's your collapse going? And what are you <laughs> drinking? And so some people, a lot of people would be like, I'm having tea. And my husband and I were like, we're having moonshine. <laughs> <laughs> like we're having whiskey, but you know, the idea of like, yeah, how's your collapse going and sitting around and just kind of shooting the shit with some drinks is a form of contact nutrition that helps us stay mobilized and stay in the, like, we're safer together energy. Um, cause yeah, yeah so the cool. paralysis is especially acute when you're by yourself. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I feel kind of like that's one of the the reasons why for a really long time in, you know, I would, people wanted me to do the rewilding 101 online and I refused because to me, it was just about, uh, you know, being together mm -hmm. and then the pandemic happened. <laughs> so I started mm -hmm. doing it online, but there are these people that are like, uh, I'm all by myself in this place. You know, I don't have anybody to talk to about these ideas. This is great. Mm -hmm. Um, and now we do this sort of, uh, you know, Rewild Portland has a philosophy, what we call the philosopher's fire, which is basically just a, a, an excuse for people to be together, at least on, on some level, um, you know, on Zoom to talk about concepts around rewilding and how to reshape culture and um, to just sort of keep that community thing going in this, in this <laughs> weird thing where we're far apart from each other, at least for the community outside of Portland, you know. Totally. Um, it's important. And I really, I, 
I always get a little like protective when people discount um, online connection in that way as though, oh, it's not as good. It's just like a, it's a, it's like, yeah, no, there are things you can do in person. Absolutely. You can't replicate online, but there are things you can do online. You can't do in person. In person, people just even somatically, our nervous systems do tend to have more inhibition. Mm -hmm. And so like, one of the things about secure attachment is the question is in your body, how safe is it for me? How comfortable do I feel approaching somebody, staying in proximity for how long? And then how does it feel for me to break that contact? All of those things are extremely charged. Totally. And what you find on Zoom is like people are in their own home. They're in their own context. Mm. They actually drop into intimacy a mm. lot quicker because our body isn't like sweating and like totally. all that stuff yeah. or it might be, but not as intensely as like if we were standing in each other's space. Yeah. So there is something about self-attunement and attunement to somebody else that that. And maybe that's why some people really like podcasts, because mm. if you are particularly oriented to vocal prosody at, and that's your contact nutrition, it really, you're, you are having legitimate, very real relationship with the people you're listening to. Totally. It's like happening in your body. Whereas if you were with them, it, it might just be like your system is overwhelmed and totally. you'd be tongue tied yeah. and you wouldn't feel the <laughs> same. Right. So yeah. yeah, yeah. I like that you're doing that. I really do. Mm. Um, cool. Yeah. Did you have any particular questions you wanted to ask me in terms of, you know, collapse and rewilding? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you talked about knowing about collapse for a long time. I, I'm like partially curious about, was there a sensitizing event? Like I, my bankruptcy was very sensitizing. Mm. Where I was like, oh, that's what collapse is. It's not just in my head. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, it was really, um, I was a very empathetic or, or maybe sensitive. I don't know. I hate fucking, I hate both the words empathetic and sensitive, especially people calling themselves empaths or super sensitive or whatever. Like, um, I just, I, <laughs> you know, I, it just seems like it's been overused or something at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, not to, you know, knock on anybody that uses those terms, but for me, I, I just was always, um, very conscious of the environment. I think my mom, um, you know, was very much a, an environmentalist and, um, just put the, the values instilled those values in me as a, as a child. And then as a teenager, um, I don't know if this is the event, <laughs> but when you say sensitizing event, it makes me, it, it makes me think of this moment where, um, my, one of my best friends, Lisa Wells, she wrote that book believers that's out now. Um, we were, <laughs> I think we were 15 at this point and we hadn't hung out in a while. Um, but we were still going to school together. And one of my friends offered to uh, give her a ride somewhere after school and we were walking around like a Fred Meyer, which is like a grocery store here in Portland. And I went by the deli section and there was like a corn dog or something. And I was hungry. I was like, I'm going to get a corn dog. <laughs> and my friend Lisa, just at the, who was vegan at the time, just like started berating me for uh, for eating a corn dog and just started like, you know, um, sort of like a scared straight kind of thing, the way vegans do that, like scared <laughs> uh scared into veganism thing she just started like deeply describing um like a, a mother pig like watching her baby slaughtered in a slaughterhouse or whatever you know and because <laughs> right. you know lisa just had this way about her um you know at, at that time she's still the same but you know we're all older and um whatever um she just like re it really was intense and impacted me in this way where i was like oh my god like you know i thought about it for days afterward and i was like i'm gonna become a vegan <laughs> or whatever right uh, and I was a vegetarian for the summer. And then at the end of the summer, um, I climbed a mountain with a friend. We were going to shoot a video up there um, for this long video project we do. And so we climbed to the top of Mount Bailey in Southern Oregon and this thunderstorm rolls in just as we get to the summit. And it starts just like pouring rain, just like pouring, pouring. And we had to run because there was lightning strikes happening and we were wow. up at the summit. So we're above the timber line. So we had to at least run back down to the timber line. So we're like running down and just completely drenched. And I just like held on to this tree. It's like pine tree that was like small and swaying in the wind. You know, it was just this like mm -hmm. super fucking epic moment um, where I could feel like the just the electricity in the air, like, mm -hmm. you know, and running through me, running through the tree I was holding. 
And I just had this like intimate moment with the tree in this context where I was like, this is a living organism too. And I'm like, by being a vegetarian or whatever, I'm like ignoring all of these plants that are like domesticated. I started thinking about the difference between wild trees and domesticated plants and grains and these things that are, you know, sprayed with herbicides and planted in mm -hmm. monocultures and these different things. You're getting very animistic. <laughs> well, this was, yeah. I mean, I'd had animist experiences prior to this, but this was sort of the, uh, the one that transformed me. So I stopped being, um, a vegetarian after that. And I had lots of conversations with people. And at that point, um, you know, uh, I, I connected with Lisa again after this to sort of have, to explain this experience I had with her. And she had just finished Daniel Quinn's book, Ishmael. And so, mm -hmm. and I had just finished uh, Tom Brown Jr.'s book, The Vision, which right. has lots of animist type stories in it. Mm -hmm. Um, and we like traded books and then, you know, um, with, with sort of the, fire and brimstone, Tom Brown, ap religious apocalypse type collapse um, vision in the vision uh, mixed with Daniel Quinn's mm -hmm. like science based sort of, you know, um, <laughs> theoretical framework around collapse. Um, those two, those two books completely transformed me. And within, you know, I mean, I read Ishmael and two days later, I dropped out of high school and ran away from home to learn wilderness survival. I ran away to go to Tom Brown Jr. school mm. um, along with Lisa and some, and two other mm -hmm. friends of ours. Mm. So that, that was, you know, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't a particular event necessarily. It was just sort of a cluster of things that happened simultaneously when I was around 16. Uh huh. And so now do you have, like, are your nearest and dearest people, are they all super collapse aware too? Do you have anybody that you're in relationship with that still kind of is like, oh, you know, Peter, you know, kind of the outlier? <laughs> That's a great question. You know, I think about this all the time because I, I created a bubble around myself, <laughs> right? Like Rewild Portland, um, you know, all the people involved, we all know what's coming, right? And I've been talking <laughs> about it for 20 years. So, you know, even my my dad, you know, for the longest time, who was like, oh, you're, you know, fine. You know, my parents both finally accepted uh, me and my, my life choices or whatever as a dropout. I started my own nonprofit or whatever. It's not my own now, but at the time, you know, and, and they were all kind of like, Peter's nuts. What are we going to do, you know? Um, and, and now it's like, well, it makes a lot of sense because we don't know what the future in the world and blah, blah, blah. And just obviously as everything is... Um, you know, continue to progress over the last 20 years since then, I feel like it's, I could strike up a conversation with almost anybody on the street and be like, hey, let's talk about collapse. And they'd be like, oh yeah, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what about it? They might not necessarily um, think that it's coming in our lifetime, but they all are essentially aware of it due to things like, um, like I said, like an inconvenient truth, you know, the Al Gore's mm -hmm. movie about climate change, just kind of like, I, I, in particular, I, I feel like climate change um, is the one thing that that catalyzed most people to kind of consider collapse. And then mm -hmm. second to that is maybe um, people aware of the Anthropocene and the sixth extinction, which isn't, mm -hmm. I think, on on par with climate change, even though it's worse and looming, <laughs> looming way worse than climate change or whatever, they're interwoven. Um, but yeah, I, I essentially mm -hmm. live in a bubble at this point where the majority of people that I know and interact with um, are conscious of collapse on some level or another. Mm hmm. And so how do you and, and your people then, I guess, how, how do you process eco grief? Amazing question, too. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm somebody who uh, I don't have a problem with grieving or crying. Like I know there's a lot of, um, you know, masculine presenting people who, you know, are trained out of out of um, crying or, you know, boys don't cry, etc. Um, I've never had that. <laughs> I just, like, I, you know, my, my life is an open book and I'll just cry in front of people. Um, <clears throat> so I don't have a problem myself in terms of just like grief in general. However, mm -hmm. um, I prefer to grieve for the most part on my own. I do prefer to uh, be in solace, uh, in, in solitude. And I have things like, um, <laughs> you know, if I want to trigger, if I feel like I'm, I'm stuck and I need to trigger um, some grieving, I have like a uh, 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 basically a, a music compilation of like songs mm -hmm. that I know will, uh, trigger Prime the pump. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and I'll just start playing it. You know, my favorite, the, the biggest one is the, um, the lullaby that was created for the movie Pan's Labyrinth, which is like my favorite movie. Yeah. Um, that one will just automatically, I'll just start crying. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I have that one in there mixed with some others from, you know, um, but there, there comes a time and, and this happened, um, a few years ago where, 
it was a particularly hot summer. I mean, as it always is, it seems to be these <laughs> days. Um, and uh, it was the first really hot summer where salmon were dying in droves up and down and even um, even uh, just all, all kinds of fish, right? And, mm -hmm. and they're washing up on the shore, like sturgeon and things like that, that are hundreds of years mm -hmm. old. They're just like washing up on the shore of the Willamette. Well, we teach summer camps on the shores of the Willamette River for mm -hmm. kids. And, you know, I was with a pack of kids. We came up on a whole bunch of dead salmon and all the children were like, why are these fish all oh. dead? You know, and I was just like, oh, oh my fuck. God. <laughs> what do That's I tell them? You know, fucking apocalypse. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, a bunch and of it just, children yeah. And, oh, and it's God. in this industrial, like the river here is industrial. Oh. So there's like these weird factories and garbage everywhere and dead fish mixed with beautiful nature and deer tracks mm -hmm. and raccoon tracks. And so it's just this weird mix of everything, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I just couldn't, I couldn't handle it. I bottled it because I didn't want to completely break down in front of these kids, <laughs> you know, um, and freak them out. Right. Yeah. Um, you didn't want to project that onto them. So I, mm -hmm. I bottled it and I kind of explained some of it as much, as best as I could. Um, but I knew Im immediately, like, this is not something I can carry by myself. Like I can't do this. And so I, um, asked some of our closest friends, you know, within around the community to do a, a community grieving ritual, if you want to call it that, or just a, you know, um, I, I'm so like turned off by a lot of the language around that kind of stuff, but uh, it was a ritual. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and a friend of mine was like, Hey, you know, um, yeah, I would love to be a part of this. Do you mind if I like facilitated it? I'm really interested in facilitating it. And I was like, Oh my God, that would be amazing. Cause I don't <laughs> have the capacity to do that either. Mm -hmm. I really just need to be a participant in something and not I need to just show up and not think about it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it was just kind of essentially really organic. You know, one of my friends, um, just let it and it was basically just uh you know we went out to the will to the woods at this beautiful lake that's really far away from everything and she just led this thing it basically created space for people to share grief in a kind of um structured way i don't want to go too much into the details of it because mm -hmm. i feel like it diminishes the experience um but it was just it was amazing you know um mm -hmm. and it was a really powerful experience and it it worked um mm -hmm. it, it really worked to kind of get to move through that in a collective way and, and feel other people's trauma and other people's grief and be able to weep for them and feel that it was like a collective experience of shared grieving. And totally. um, I haven't done anything on that scale since then, I, I, even though there's been a lot more things, you know, the, the, the area of wilderness that I've gotten to know over the past 20 years and thought was going to be the place I would escape to if things got too bad, uh, burned down in the fires two years ago mm -hmm. here. And I lost everything. We're, it, we haven't been able to go there in mm -hmm. two years and they're finally going to reopen it to the public, um, in a couple mm -hmm. months, which will be awesome for me to go in, be able to go back in there. But essentially the apocalypse came to the place I was hoping to go to when the apocalypse came, mm -hmm. <laughs> it came there yeah. first. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm still just like welling up in tears. You know, I, I, th I feel like that, that experience is just gonna, um, stay with me for a long time, especially the more I, I mean, I went out there, I, even though we're not supposed to, <laughs> uh, I did go out there and I hiked through it and it was beautiful to see the life returning. Right. I think that was in and of itself, a kind of ritual to see, um, uh, the resilience of life coming back after devastation and, and on some level knowing that the fire needed to happen, you know, it's like mm -hmm. you were saying, I think um, this harkens back to what you're saying about a collapse needing to happen, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like that is the case on the land too. And in a lot of instances, especially where fire suppression has really, um, and monoculture in particular, has really affected these these wild lands. Yeah. Um, well, and the ritual, it's interesting that you say, like you did go back and it felt kind of like one way of looking at ritual is that it is one of our human making technologies, right? Totally. It, it, ritual is one of the ways that we develop inner coherence and kind of give things a beginning, middle and end, you know? So, and if we don't do it in a conscious way, you know, Francis Weller talks about this in the wild edge of sorrow. If we don't intentionally do ritual we'll do it unconsciously mm. we'll have rituals of mm. numbing or rituals of mm. discharging stress or rituals of lashing out or whatever totally. it is right like
like, and sometimes they're harmful for right. us or for others. And so doing it in a conscious way is a way that, because we will just keep trying to ritualize this thing. One of my favorite people, and like anyone can fight me on this, is Bruce Springsteen. And he talks <laughs> about this. I can't remember if this is like an article a number of years ago, or if he's like talking and like playing the guitar in a live album or something. Anyway, he's talking about like, he's talking to a psychologist he's super depressed. And he's like, yeah, I keep, I'm, I have insomnia. I keep waking up in the middle of the night and I get in my car and I drive to my old neighborhood and I drive past the houses where I grew up. And I just, I'm like compulsive. I can't help mm. it. I mean, wake up and go drive. What the hell is the matter with me? Like these are strangers houses. Now mm. I feel a stalker. And his uh, psychologist is like, no, something bad happened. And you mm. want to go back and make it right. Mm. And so you're doing this unconscious ritual. And so the thing about developing some basic ritual literacy is that then we can do it more consciously. And Amazing. sometimes it's, you know, we need a larger container. And so we, we need the collective to, to help us through that. Um, but, you know, sometimes silence and solitude together are enough. And that is our ritual, right? Like, oh, I listen to the music. I have a good cry. It feels great, right? <laughs> Mine is like, if I go into the shower in the middle of the day, looking a little bit salty in the eyes, Carmen is having the ritual of falling apart in the shower. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like sometimes mm. I just need the water to like mm. prime the pump, mm. right? So it's nice to be able to name those things as like, this is the technology of coping um, that we have as humans. <laughs> I, I want to ask you, I, you were probably running out of time, but I, I really, I get very like kind of hyper and keen on like hearing people's future scenarios hundred years from now. What do you think is the best case scenario for a hundred years from now? And the second thing is like, tell me about your preps. <laughs> what are you like, working on right now? Awesome. Cool. Yeah. So 100 year scenario, best case scenario. Um, I think the first person who explained attrition to me was um, Toby Hemingway, who's the author of Gaia's Garden and City Permaculture. In his um, permaculture design course I took in 2009, um, he talked about attrition, which I had never heard before, um, which is essentially that population decline can happen over a long span instead of abruptly. And it's essentially that uh, people stop having babies, they become less fertile and elder people just pass away and people aren't getting replaced. And so it's a, a way of essentially a, a softened decline instead of an abrupt collapse. Um, and so I think about that often when I think about, uh, you know, softening the collapse of civilization or, or what we could do that would um, transition it away. I have a hard time imagining that that's going to be a reality, but we're talking about best case scenario. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was in Arizona at uh, Winter Count a few years ago, which is a ancestral skills gathering down there, I stopped in um, at the museum in Austin. I think it's the University of Austin's museum, and they had a whole exhibit on the Hohokam civilization. And um, you know, people talk about it as a as a civilization that collapsed, even though the Ododum are you know a continuity, a living continuity of the Hohokam civilization. Um, the, the interesting thing about that was that there was a whole thing about attrition, that their civilization declined over the span of 200 years. And there isn't a lot of evidence of an abrupt collapse. It just stopped being fertile over a period of time and people migrated away or didn't have more children in those places. So I started kind of, I mean, I'm still going down the rabbit hole of exploring that more. Um, but to me, that's kind of one thing to think about in terms of um, a soft transition to a different kind of future. I think in 100 years, um, you know, nuclear power plants uh, theoretically would still have babysitters. <laughs> <laughs> They've been powered down, but there's generations of people teaching them how to, um, you know, maintain them so they're not melting down completely. Um, until they can, you know, I don't know however long it's going to take for nuclear reactors to completely, um, you know, become shut down once they're started or how long the radiation is going to be there. Uh, that's going to be a challenge regardless. There's so many nuclear reactors in the world at this point. That's one of the things I think about the most in terms of collapse is nuclear radiation. Mm -hmm. um, those things are the two things I think about the most in terms of a transition and how I think, you know, we're, I see horticultural lifestyles. I see people that have created limitation, cultural limitations to growth. I don't know if there will be, um, you know, a complete egalitarian hunter gatherers all over the world. I highly doubt that. So I would imagine yeah. a more That's... egalitarian, you know, horticultural <laughs> um, way of life 
uh, you know, a hundred years from now, that, that, that would be the ideal scenario. That would be ideal. I, I'm <laughs> a little bit afraid to ask you what you actually think is going <laughs> Cause like that actually sounds kind of utopian to me. Any totally. kind of Cause like totally. the, all signs right now are pointing to the other path, the more oh, realistic man. path of like huge disparities <laughs> between yeah. autocracies so, and yeah, scaling back of rights. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. That's a, that I'm, is a nice best case scenario. And maybe I'll share my best case scenario. <laughs> I also think mostly about population mm -hmm. and, you know, and it's interesting to develop even more nuance around this conversation when we think about um, eco-fascism and, totally. you know, you, you yes. really can't talk about population without people going like slapping you across the face, like fascist. It's like, no, no, right. no, 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 no. Like we're talking about just basic limits to growth here. I'm not saying what we should do. I'm just saying like, here's what, here's a problem yep. and um, energy, right? How much energy we don't actually have enough surface land surface area for the energy inputs required totally. to keep a body yes. alive. So yes. I think we're just going to like one way or another, it, it is going to um, come back down to the actual able to be sustained level. Yes. And I don't think humans are going to intentionally do this. This is just going totally. to happen to yep. us and yep. able to be sustained. So I think a hundred years from now, it'll be more like a hundred years ago when there was like Absolutely. one and a half billion, two billion people on the planet. And I think like what we could just roughly say quality of life or styles of life will be pretty similar to like totally. just pre-World War One, yeah. where it's like a bunch of rural, uh, but a whole bunch that are like in the cities for economic reasons. But it, it, it that's kind of what I think is going to happen um, just with population. And so that's going to change like our, our, just our energy input to keep a human person alive, we're not going to be able to do totally. it. And, and, and that of course is going to create wars and all different kinds of things. But so best case scenario, like you say, it is like a slightly more, I don't think we're going to be totally, um, totally pastoral, totally like rural. We're not going to be, I don't think even best case scenarios like hunter gather, I think it's going to be like 1900, 1910, yeah. 1915, yeah. those kinds of those things that were happening pre-World War One, just right before it. That's what I assume my child's elderhood is going to mm. look like. It's like that, you know, probably dying younger than I do kind of, you know, I have an 18 year old right now. So I'm like, okay, what's the math on this? They're probably not going to have a kid. Maybe they will, but I doubt it, you know? So yeah, I think there's like a combination of attrition and like pandemic and war that will take care of a lot of things. What do you think yeah. is really probably going to happen? <laughs> well, I mean, this gets into, you know, a conversation around like hope and despair and all these things. You know, I constantly, I don't really, um, there's a, there's a balance that I, before I say my worst case scenario, <laughs> <laughs> um, the balance I have with worst case scenario is that I, I consider my purpose in life is to just create more life. Um, and if more people just do, you know, create as much life as they can within their, and I don't mean human life specifically, I just mean, you know, regenerative life ways mm -hmm. um, and focus on those as much as possible. And then I'm going to die at some point. I could get hit by a car tomorrow. I mm -hmm. could get killed by fascists in 10 mm -hmm. years. I don't, you know, um, I could die of a, of a new disease or something, right? Like I could die of starvation. There's just so many different factors that apply in um, disrupted and collapsing societies. But the three main factors that are going to reduce the human population are going to be famine, disease, and war, right? Like mm -hmm. those are just the three key things. And there's not a lot you can do about <laughs> those three things, right? <laughs> There's yeah. just not a lot. I mean, you can, you know, learn to grow your own food. Great. But, in a, but then, you know, people are going to come and take your whatever, you know, there's the, with, with the way that war and, uh, you know, collapse works, violence gets decentralized from the state. So right now the state is, you know, the main force of violence that enforces, you know, law enforcement, right? That goes away. What happens? It decentralizes. So you have, instead of one group, that's the state, you have you know, roaming groups that are all diversified on smaller scales that are determining how violence is distributed. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that the state removed violence, it's that they've centralized it. So, um, you know, people in privilege experience uh, less violence because of the ones, the, the monoculture <laughs> of that violence, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so when that goes away, violence gets 
distributed evenly <laughs> <laughs> or more evenly, I should say, not necessarily. There are different, you know, demographics that have more firearms, for example, which could give them a leg up in terms of how violence is distributed. But, um, you know, thinking in terms of, of that, uh, worst case scenario, I mean, you know, worst case scenario is just like nuclear war, everybody dies, right? Like that's just, you know, but, yeah. but even then, like to me, in a geological time scale, like I'm here to be a human. So I'm just going to be as human as I can while I'm here. So there's just sort of a yeah. reconciliation that happens in my, internally of like what I do right now actually doesn't matter in a million years or 10 mm -hmm. million years, you know, um, in the scheme of things, it's completely irrelevant. So the relevance is only applied to the living existence and the living experience that I have. Mm -hmm. And if I just mm -hmm. think about the day to day experience of being a human and not um, project a concept of like, well, I need to do all of this stuff so that everything will be great in the future. There's no way to do that. There's no yes. way to ever have everything great. You know, an asteroid could hit in a thousand years and kill everything on the planet, right? The seventh extinction or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just thinking in terms of that, like, you know, what can I do on a day-to-day -day basis and how do I frame my life and perception around a day-to-day -day thing of just like being the totally. best human I can every day that I wake up and I, and I go to bed at night and I'm like, did I do everything I could to be a great human? Cool. Totally. And if this I die brings tomorrow... me back to the meal, right? Yes. It's like totally. literally it comes back yes. to the meal. It's like, yes. what's the smallest? And it's like, yeah, similarly, my, th like the thing that I'm reaching towards that I care about is that I happen to be incarnate as a human right now and not my dog and not the plum tree outside and not the seed I'm planting in the ground. I actually have this like really kind of somewhat unique, it, though shared in some ways, but a somewhat unique expression of this experience of being a human. And so the thing that really matters to me is the quality of the expression of my exactly. humanness. Like it's exactly. like, what is the quality yes. of my human experience? Yes. And so yeah, that the fact that I'm like eating a radish that I dipped in butter and salted at the right time and like, and I happen to grow it. And it's like the radish is, is part of this whole kind of mutuality and reciprocity that I'm experiencing. And now I get to share it with my neighbor or my, my son or who, whatever, you know, it's like that whole experience. Well, my husband and I, we call it the small and delicious life. Mm -hmm. And going back to that article, which was called preparing for a beautiful end, mm -hmm. the Utney reader, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's about the, the food and the joy and the pleasure of self provender and the quality of our humanness while we're experiencing. Yeah, there's a lot of like pain out there, but when you put pain and beauty together, you get this poignance and poignance is like my favorite emotion. It's so like intense. I'm a Scorpio. So I'm like, <laughs> Oh, poignant, you know, I like, but that is like a, a fairly like apt description of like the quality of my humanness is going to be all of it. I want to be able to be present to all of it. And so I want to share in other people's pain and despair. I, it, there's like this beautiful humanness about it that I'm privileged to witness. And I don't want them to be alone in the terror. Um, I think being together in the terror of whatever this like thing is that's going to happen and we don't know when there, there's a poignance and an intimacy and a bonding in that that really matters to me living out however many hours I have days I don't know I could have thousands of hours maybe not that many <laughs> totally. right yeah. so um, yeah I it's like the I don't it could be any number of worst case scenarios and I'm going to be figuring out what kind of cool things I can do with this can of beans and a like a little bit of herbs I found, <laughs> you know, yeah. like yeah. grasses and whatever. I'm going to be like trying to figure out like what's the kind of quality of experience I could be having right now. Cause you know what, if I, if I make capers out of these nasturtium pods in my garden, the Sultan of Brunei can't get those. This is so rare and exquisite and exclusive to me, right? It's like, mm. that is really amazing. And I want to be able to share that with people. And it makes the quality of all the other things that happen to us worthwhile. I want to, I want to witness those things. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me on the cool. show, Peter. You're this welcome. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah. Awesome. Um, is there any last things you wanted to mention? Um. Well, I mean, I guess I should say this. I have this cookbook coming out. What does that have to do with things? It, it really is about orienting towards the wheel of the year as 
an animistic practice. It's, it's that contact nutrition of like eating and drinking together in tune with the rhythm of the cycle of the year where you are. Um, so it's called the spirited kitchen recipes and rituals for the wheel of the year. It's coming out in uh, the fall of 2022, October 18th from WW Norton. If people want to like track that with me and want to know when pre-orders and things like that are happening, my website is just my name, carmenspaniola.com. You can sign up for the newsletter. We'll let you know when it's happening. But what I really hope is that people who aren't cooks will kind of like it because it's like, oh, okay. It's like a way of being. It's a philosophy. I'm like really excited because my editors didn't make me cross out the parts where I talk about the Black Panthers and the Zapatistas and stuff like that. (laughs) (laughs) So it's like a pretty cool cookbook. Um, Mm. And people who are cooks who want to make mealtimes like more meaningful, who want to have this connective and corrective experience of um, mealtimes being like an opportunity for bonding and contact nutrition. I mean, that's woven into the stories and and also it's for like kitchen witches right who are it's I went to Le Cordon Bleu in Paris so like if you want some challenging recipes there's a couple in there my friends for like Paris breast pastries and macaron and things like that I put that up to, against like anyone and any any chef um, but also for people who are just like new into like kitchen witchery and like actually want to go deeper um, I'm really, really influenced by people like Sylvia Federici and Black socialist feminists like the Combahee River Collective. And, and that gets like woven into, this is the place where you end up as a collapse aware, trauma-informed, <laughs> attachment-oriented animist, you end up at the Spirited Kitchen. Awesome. Amazing. Yeah. Thanks for letting me share that. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Mm-hmm. It's been a pleasure. Good chat. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Rewilding Podcast. Check out the show notes to connect with my guests and for a list of resources that we mentioned in our conversation. If this episode inspired you, made you think more deeply, or gave you some new tools to use, make sure to subscribe and support my work by becoming a patron of the Rewilding Podcast at patreon.com slash petermichaelbauer. And as always, you can help by writing a review on Apple Podcasts and make sure to share on social media. Thank you for listening. Until next time. Mm -hmm.